I'd invite the children and young people to join me down front. This is fine. There were more of you out there than I realized. Yeah, you were hiding. Great. I'll be right with you. I've got my chair. What's special about today? Father's Day. What's that mean? Does the day belong to fathers, or what's Father's Day mean? It's a holiday for fathers. And what was that? It means it's giving a card to someone. Yes, someone special. You want to give a card to your daddy? You know, I remember when it was Father's Day, and my wife and I took our two daughters out for dinner. We all went out for dinner to celebrate Father's Day. And one of my daughters was like maybe six, and the waitress came over, and she was all excited. And my daughter, she said, guess what? And the waitress said what? She said, today's Father's Day. Yeah. And we're taking Dad out to dinner. Yeah. And he's paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> We all both paid for it, but isn't it funny, you know, how we, we, it's a holiday. We celebrate dads. Yes, Maggie? My dad is in Indiana. Indiana. Far away. Far away place. And there you go. Some dads are close by and some are far away. Now, I want you to help me do something today, and I'll explain it later. We're going to honor our fathers today, but we're going to do something else first. I want you to help get all the men in the church to come down front. Would you do that for me, please? All the men. Yeah. And every man who's here, come on down. Come on down. You don't have to be a dad. I want all the men down here. The only one who's exempt is our cameraman. Thank you. If you see any men hiding under the pews, go get them. I don't see any. Okay. I see one. But he's got to run the camera, so he's exempt. Okay. Now I want to ask, I want to ask you guys this. Do you think that men like to sing in church? Do you think men like to sing in church? No, no. Uh, some of them do. You know what some do? They move their lips and they hope that we'll think they're singing. <laughs> now, do you think, you think I can get these men to sing in church today? Yes. You do? Oh, that's a, I'm going to bet you that I can. I'm going to get them to sing in church today. Okay? You know why? It depends on what we sing. Okay, guys, one, two, three. Take me out to the ball. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me something and sing cracker jacks. I don't care if I ever get back to this room. Root, root for the Randall Sox. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old. would have believed that the men would have sung to you in church. <laughs> What's that? Sweet Caroline. Sweet Caroline. <laughs> See, miracles still happen. Now, I want you to stand up. The young people are all, all going to stand up. And I want you to face, you can face your dad if your dad's here. You can face anywhere you want. We're going to do a blessing. So you face any way you want. Everybody stand up and offer your hands out because you know what? Some of you have dads who are here. Some of you who have dads who live in Indiana, who are far away. My dad is in heaven with God, and some of us don't have our dads anymore with us, but we all had a dad, okay? So let's bless our fathers. Let's just hold out our hands and ask God to flow through us. Oh God, we thank you for our dads. Some are with us. Some aren't. We thank you for those who serve as fathers, who are mentors. We thank you for those who 
perhaps never had children, but guide and invest and love. Thank you. Bless them all and bless us as we seek to be more your family in Christ. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for participating in our Father's Day blessing. And let's give all of our men a hand. Okay, now I, there's a children's program, there's nursery care. You can go to class now. The scripture passage this morning comes from the first letter of John. Sometimes people get confused because there's the Gospel of John, which is much larger, has many chapters, but there are some letters from John, and they have a different tone to them. And this is really, the passage today is at the heart and soul of his message. And it's from 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 to 21. He says, we love because we were first loved. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. There we have it, straight and simple. I'm going to do something a little different today. I am going to offer a vignette, and I will take on the part of John Quincy Adams. And just a couple things, the title is A Father's Legacy, and this will come up in the text about how important his father was. But it's always important to be reminded that the lessons that most touch us from guides, mentors, parents, aren't often in words used when, we are sat, when they sit us down and try to teach us. It's more the way they modeled their faith, their hope, or their trust, and what they did with their lives. And so I'd like you to think about that as you think of one, the people who have helped to shape you, mothers and fathers, coaches or ministers or uncles or someone else. And what was it that was special? because we also are teachers and we leave a legacy too. So, I was born on July 8, 11th, 1767, just down the road a piece in, which it's in Quincy now, but it used to be part of Braintree. The Declaration of Independence was signed when I was nine years old and the Revolutionary War came shortly thereafter. As the Chinese have said, may you grow up or live in interesting times, that was certainly the case for me. My father, John Adams, was one of the founding fathers, and he was easily the most influential man in my life. He is well known for having been the second president of the fledgling United States of America, and the chief architect of the U.S. Constitution. But did you know that it was he who defended the hated British soldiers during the Boston Massacre? That's the man I most admired. He knew that the facts of the case were being buried under a deep sense of public outrage and a need for revenge. But he stuck with the facts and the soldiers were acquitted. He was none too popular in Boston at that time. But he knew that a conviction of these men would have been a foul stain on our people's integrity just as we were coming into being. And it would have sullied our reputation in the realm of world opinion. This instead was a people who stood up for justice even for their enemies. I never forgot that lesson. In my years, we could not have possibly foreseen all that America would become, but I must admit that I'm not surprised. Our nation developed a moral mission to share with the world about freedom, integrity, human rights, and the inherent dignity of all people. While we certainly haven't always lived up to that demanding standard, it has shaped our national soul. 
May God make us worthy of our stated ideals, because they are noble indeed. I was blessed with a penetrating mind, a fine education at Harvard, a scope broadened by world travels, including service to our country with my father at an early age, and a very, shall we say, intense personality. In other words, I was a pain. While those qualities proved very helpful in some aspects of diplomacy and political life, they were not sufficiently balanced with an appreciation nor an aptitude for the art of human relationship, shall we say. This too, I suspect, I learned from my father. He was as loyal a patriot as they came. But he was the one whom Benjamin Franklin insisted be recalled back home to the States from his position as negotiator with France because he had so offended the French court with his shortcomings on the relational side of things. He just didn't have that common touch that diplomacy requires. I, like him, saw truth as something crystal clear, especially through my own particular lens. I was not patient with those who didn't see it that way or who, worse, had the audacity to disagree with me in public. The only way I knew how to express myself in the midst of a conflict was with relentless force. I would seek to overwhelm my opponents with more and better informa information, often employing ample doses of sarcasm and some wit, but very little genuine humor. It just wasn't in me. Adjectives used to describe me from friends and foes, hypercritical, determined, acrimonious, impatient, and rude. I was once described as a bulldog among spaniels. I hate to admit it, but they were not far off. In the privacy of my own diary, I describe myself as dogmatic, peremptory, cold, overbearing, and harsh. I have not the pliability to reform myself. Now, I was quite different in every regard from President Andrew Jackson, Jackson who defeated me when I ran for a second term in 1829. Interestingly, neither of the Adamses served a second term which was interesting and unusual in those days. When asked to attend a Harvard ceremony conferring an honorary degree on President Jackson, I politely declined with this not so gracious comment. I would not be present to witness Harvard's disgrace in conferring her highest honors upon a barbarian who could not write a sentence nor even hardly spell his own name." End quote. I took no prisoners. <laughs> After my defeat to Jackson, I was elected to the House, where I served for many more years, the only time in history when a former president has gone back into Congress and served. And you have to wonder about that. Here's a man who describes himself as kind of arrogant, but he took, he took a step down the authority ladder. He was president, now he's going back in and starting all over again, building seniority. It took an unusual man to do that. It was here in the House that the whole sordid issue of slavery began to come into focus for me. And this was in the 1830s. I was a latecomer, but I finally concluded that slavery simply could not be reconciled with our stated ideals in the Declaration of Independence. I became intensely involved with the fierce debates about such things as whether Texas would be admitted as a slave state or not, and then the Missouri Compromise. Personal attacks by my enemies only seemed to intensify my resolve. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that I must have sulfuric acid in my tea. And I think he might have said, who needs to dilute it with tea? Even though the Civil War took place after my death, I could see it coming. I could detect no room for compromise on either side. For me, all of this was crystallized in the intriguing case of the Amistad. And as an aside, in 1739, a group of native Mendi from Sierra Leone were captured and brought in a slave ship to Cuba to work the sugarcane fields. 
while being transported from Havana then to the fields, the Mendy overwhelmed the crew. They killed them, except for the navigator. And then they ordered him to take the ship back to Africa. Now he decided to try to hoodwink them. And during the day, he sailed toward Africa. At night, he sailed north. So eventually, the rogue ship was captured off the coast of Long Island. While slavery was still thriving in the United States as an institution, the slave trade itself had been banned. No more Africans being brought in to the country were allowed. A whole array of complex questions arose about this case. Were the Mendy to be considered slaves? Were they the property of the company that transported them? Or were they the property of the US Navy who could claim them as salvage? Were they mutineers and murderers? Or were they free men with rights, whose rights had been abused? John Quincy Adams, at age 74, was asked to argue the case when it was appealed and was taken to the US Supreme Court in 1841. Now he hesitated, saying, I was busy in Congress, and my faculties, like my teeth, had been dropping out one by one. One time he was stopped on the street in Quincy and someone said, and how is John Quincy Adams? And he said, well, John Quincy Adams is just fine. He said, but the windows in the upstairs are all kind of opaque now, hard to see through. The thatch on the roof is getting very thin and the very underpinnings of the foundation are starting to crumble. But as for John Quincy Adams, he's never been better, never been better. Now that's an interesting thing to say. His essence was still the same, still filled with sulfuric acid, but at any rate. For him, the injustice was apparent and that made his blood boil. And I thought, he said, of my father standing up for justice with the Boston Massacre. My position, these Mendy were men like any other. They were not slaves. They were not mutineers or murderers. They were oppressed men illegally kidnapped from their homeland and taken from there, who fought for their freedom and shed blood in the process. And now he makes his brilliant argument, but was not America forged out of the very same circumstances? Did we not call heroic those who took up arms to fight for their freedom in our country? Why was this scene as different? Hey, in so doing, John Quincy Adams was ahead of his time, declaring that blacks were as fully human as anybody else. Could a person really belong to another as property? America had thus far successfully put off answering that question, but 20 years later, they wouldn't be able to avoid it anymore. He said, they tell me that I spoke for four and a half hours before the Supreme Court without intermission and that I captured their full attention. I lifted up a copy of the Declaration of Independence and I declared that if we did not honor the rights of these Africans, then we would be committing political blasphemy. Strong words. But the situation required strong words and a strong man, a strong person. I later concluded my arguments with another three hour barrage. You know, I wonder if the Supreme Court just wanted to get rid of him and said, okay, we've heard enough. And the court voted to set the Mendy free. Landmark case, huge implications. Shortly thereafter, they set sail for home with the blessings of the United States. Some said it was my finest hour and something of which America should be proud, although most don't know about it today. Sadly, the bloody Civil War will begin in 20 years. Inevitable, but regrettable. I was not one to welcome retirement. Seven years later, in the midst of a heated debate on the floor of the House chamber, I suffered a massive stroke, and I died two years later, two days later, February 23rd, 1848, in my 80th year. Talk about dying with your boots on. It's just what he did. Can't imagine it happening any other way. 
My career was certainly varied. Now listen to all the th posts he held. Ambassador to Portugal, ambassador to Russia, ambassador to Great Britain, ambassador to Germany, secretary of state, member of the US Senate, member of the US House of Representatives, president of the United States of America. And last but certainly not least, defender of the disempowered Mendy in the case of the Amistad. My remains are buried in the basement of the Church of the Presidents right in Quincy Square. In the inscription written by my son Charles is this phrase, near this place reposes all that could die of John Quincy Adams. My final admonition, remember that the life of faith and citizenship is not a popularity contest. Sometimes our most shining moments are best defined by the enemies that we make. If that is the case for me, then my struggles against the evils of slavery were the most godly actions I ever took. Amen.